covered vegetative morphology on the last class. And so we're going to extend from there. And today what we're going to talk about will be the other portion of the life cycle of a tree, uh, which you see here includes the tree getting to reproductive maturity, producing seed, and that seed then germinating with all the seed. So when y'all take botany, you do a lot of work with flowers, right? Uh, you focus on floral diagrams. You look at all the different parts of a flower, uh, and there's good reason for that. Flowers are very unique between trees and other flowering plants, and they help us discern what the different species are morphologically. However, with trees, flowers often aren't the most useful thing uh, to look at, because often they're pretty small, and often they're you know, 50 to 100 feet in the air. So they may not be that helpful in dendrology. And so there are a few concepts around flowers, however, they're gonna help us understand the silvix of trees. Again, the silvix is gonna be the ecology of our forest trees. And so we have the female part of the plant, the pistil, the male part of the plant, the stamen. And so if a flower, it has both a pistil and a stamen, it's both male and female, the term for that is perfect. That's a perfect flower it has both sexes. Uh, if it's missing either the pistil or the stamen, then it's a unisexual flower. Uh, the term for that is imperfect. So you would have either an imperfect male flower or an imperfect female flower. There are two other major floral parts. Uh, we also have the sepals and the petals. So if a flower has all four parts, the pistil, stamen, sepals, and petals, we call it a complete flower. If it's missing any one of those, we call it an incomplete. So can you have a incomplete flower that's perfect? Can an incomplete flower be perfect? So yes, yes it can, so how? Right, so if uh, an incomplete flower is incomplete because it's missing either the sepals or the petals or both the sepals and the petals, that means it still has the pistil and the stamen, meaning that it's still by definition perfect. Um, if you have an incomplete flower, can it be imperfect? Yeah, th those could go along as well. So if it's missing a pistil or a stamen, it could be incomplete and imperfect. Um, but if you have a imperfect flower, you know that it's not going to be complete. So that, that's how all these terms combine and work together. That's really looking primarily focused on just one flower. Um, but when we want to look at the whole tree, it gets a little bit different. And so this first part's a little confusing. Most of you have probably heard the, the term monoecious before. And we know that mono means one. So it sounds like a monoecious tree should have one sex, because mono means one, but it's backwards for that. Monoecious means one house, and so the metaphor is that both sexes are living within one house. So a monoecious tree actually is both male and female. That can happen a few different ways. If it has one complete or perfect flower on it, we know that that flower has both male and female parts, the pistil and the stamen, which means we know that the sex uh, of that tree is both male and female. We know it's monoecious. You do have many forest trees, however, where the flowers are imperfect. You have separate male and female flowers but that tree will have both those flowers on the same tree. So that's another way that a tree could be monoecious. Almost all the trees that we're doing this semester in lab are gonna be monoecious. It's very common. So all the oaks we're learning, all the pines we're learning, all the hickories, all the members of the rosaceae, the rose family that has a lot of our fruit trees in it, plums, cherries, those are gonna be uh, monoecious birches, elms, lagoons. So these are some of our larger groups of trees we're learning in lab. Uh, most of our maples, but not all, and then most of the other species that aren't easy to lump into a big group. So if you have to guess if a tree in lab is monoecious, it probably is. There are a number of dioecious species, and with a dioecious tree, the tree is either male or female, okay? Um, you'll commonly see different applications of dioecious species. Uh, so how many folks are in urban forest? we got a number of you in urban forestry. It's very common in urban forestry for some species to see all male trees planted. Um, and the reason for that is then you don't have the fruits getting on the sidewalk, driveway, um, and causing a mess. Uh, because a male tree cannot produce fruit. 
So in many urban areas, many taxa like junipers, ginkgos, mulberries, uh, they'll try to plant all male trees. The downside to that is male trees are the ones that are producing pollen. Uh, so from an allergy standpoint, that may not be ideal. It may be a little bit better uh, to have a mix of trees. So, so that's one application. Um, if, if you go into production forestry and you're trying to manage the production of a lot of seeds, so you can put that seed in a nursery and sell seedlings, well, if your species is dioecious, you need to know that because when you structure your nursery, you're going to need a blend of male and female trees in the right ratios so that you can produce enough seed to meet the nursery needs. So there's lots of reasons why we want to know uh, whether a tree is going to be dioecious or not. Um, here are pretty much all the trees that we're going to learn in lab this semester that are dioecious. Um, so that list of Anisha species was not complete. Uh, this is com as complete a list as I can put together for our lab species. So the ashes and fringe tree, which is in the ash family, are dioecious. Uh, the junipers are dioecious, many of them, and so that includes eastern red cedar. Box elder is one very odd maple. It's a maple with compound leaves, and it's dioecious, so it's a little different than the other maples. Our willows and cottonwoods are both in the willow family, that's to say the Paceae family. Common persimmon, the hollies, ginkgo. Uh, our grapevines are actually dioecious. So if you see a grapevine and it just never seems to be producing any grapes, it's possible that's a male grapevine. Osage orange and sassafras, tree of heaven, eastern baccarus, red bait, poison ivy is actually dioecious, uh, and then one of our ornamental trees, Chinese pistachio. So that, that's the complete list of our lab trees that are going to be uh, dioecious. Okay, so that's all we really need to know about flowers in dendrum. So we don't cover it nearly as much as you will in botany. Um, let's talk a little bit about seeds and then move on from there from seeds to fruit. Uh, so with seeds, seeds are going to have three basic components. They need to have the embryonic tissues that's going to become the future plant. They need some sort of storage. So are plants autotrophic or heterotrophic? They're autotrophic. They make their own food. They do that through photosynthesis. Can this seed photosynthesize? Not yet, right? Okay, so it needs food stored up until it can get to the point that it can be autotrophic and make its own food. And then in the real world, you're going to need some sort of protection uh, to prevent predation, disease, uh, mechanical damage to the seed. So those are the three parts. The cotyledon in this example is the storage, the seed coats, the protection, and the embryo is our embryonic tissue. So how do we disperse seeds? Uh, we disperse them in a bunch of different ways. Uh, so we have a lot of seed dispersed by wildlife, so that's very common, whether it gets consumed or passed through the gut, dispersed that way, uh, or whether wildlife carry it around and cache it, bury it, um, so that they can eat it later. We have a lot of seeds that are dispersed via wind. Uh, so this is an example of Florida maple samaras right there, where you can see the little wing on the seed, and so that'll disperse it. We have some examples of seed that disperses via water. So there's a classic example where you have a coconut palm and that uh, fruit will, will wash up here uh, and you have the seed moving via water. We have seed that moves via water even here in East Texas. Um, so some of our hickories, you know, they'll grow on our wetter sites and the, the nuts can float. And so we think that's how some of them can disperse some of the time, not all the time. Uh, trees like Chinese tallow that are common in our bottom lands, we probably have a lot of seed moving around there by water. And so water is more common than you'd think even here in East Texas. Uh, there was an interesting experiment this researcher, uh, Beale, did uh, in England over 100 years ago. Uh, basically, he took seeds from a bunch of different species, he put them in glass bottles, and he buried them in his garden. And so the temperature would have been the same, the light conditions would have been the same but you just didn't get a lot of humidity in there that was causing the seeds to break down. Um, he then, you know, dug one up after a year, dug one up after two years, sowed the seeds uh, and saw what germinated. And so he kept doing this as part of his research. Well, eventually he passed away. Uh, someone figured out what he had been doing, went into the literature, found his research. Then they went and they found his garden. And then they went and they actually dug up the garden, found some of these bottles that had been buried for 120 years at this point, emptied them out, sowed the seeds, and some of those seeds actually germinate. And so some of our species have seed that can last for a really long time. Uh, so Chinese tallow is one example. When you look in the literature, 
Some sources in the literature say the seed will last a year or less. Some sources say it'll last 100 years or more, which is a pretty good way of saying we really don't know. Um, you know, we're not certain how long it'll survive. Okay, with seeds, they need to form a new plant, right? So that's gonna be through the process of germination. And so you have these embryonic tissues. So the radical is the embryonic roots, the hypocotyl is the embryonic shoot, and the epicotyl is the embryonic leaf. So we have different terms for our embryonic uh, tissues than we do in a mature plant. Uh, but then we also have the cotyledons, which are seed leaves. It's actually important for some species to be able to identify the seed leaves, the cotyledons. They often look different than the mature leaves. So for example, in red maple cotyledons, they're round, they don't really look quite as maple leaf shaped yet. But if you're doing a seedling survey, so you know what trees are regenerating on your site to help you manage that site, you may have to identify the cotyledons. So on some species, that's gonna be helpful. So with angiosperms, we've already seen they're really diverse. More than 60,000 species of trees are angiosperms, okay? Well, it oddly turned out the best way to figure out how the angiosperms was evolved was just to count these little tiny seed leaves and see if they had two or if they had one. And so that's what a dicot is and a monocot. A dicot, which is almost all the trees we're learning this semester, uh, has two cotyledons. The monocots, which is gonna be palm trees, uh, yuccas, grasses, we'll learn a handful of them this semester. They only have one cotyledon. So who would have thought just one little seed leaf when the tree is that tall is sort of the distinguishing division between the huge group that is our angiosperms. Uh, when we work on dichotomous keys to identify tr unknown trees in East Texas, you're going to see one of the first splits for the angiosperms is asking you, is it a monocot or is it a dicot? Is it in the magnoliopsida, which is the dicots, or is it in the liliopsida? We'll get to that. Okay, as seeds germinate, they can do it in one of two ways, and it's going to depend on which species you're looking at. They can have epigeal germination, where epa means above. And so here the cotyledons pop up above the ground. So we're going to see this in American beech, in Carolina basswood, in our different maples, where the cotyledons pop up above ground, you can see the cotyledons. The other alternative is hypogeal germination, where hypo means below. So here the cotyledons remain below the ground. And so if you think about it, with an oak seedling, the first leaf you see, it looks like a little oak leaf, okay? With a hickory seedling, the first leaves you see look like little hickory leaves. And that's because those trees have large nuts. The nuts remain below ground and the cotyledons remain in the nut. And so they don't actually pop the cotyledons up above the ground. So, um, it, it's a useful feature because it helps them store uh, the, the sugars, the extra sugars they have in those cotyledons. They're storing it below ground. So the ground's offering a little bit of protection from predation. So it's a useful strategy. That's a little bit about germination. And again, you get into all these topics in greater depth in botany. Uh, but now let's talk about how we describe seeds. But really what we focus on in dendro for the most part, is not the seeds themselves, but what we tend to focus on from an identification standpoint is gonna be the fruit. And so we need to look at what's the difference between a seed and a fruit. And at its simplest level, fruits contain seeds. Okay, so fruits contain seeds. Because the seed is the ripened ovule, and the fruit is the ripened ovary. And then the ovary wall is going to develop into the fruit wall, which we call the pericarp. And depending on the fruit you're looking at, the pericarp can develop into different layers. And so here's an example where we're looking at a peach, uh, which is going to be in the rosaceae family. And so as we look at this peach, you have the endocarp, which is our stone casing on the seed in the middle in the pit. Then you have the mesocarp, which is the fleshy part that people like to eat. And then you have the exocarp, which is the fuzzy skin on a peach. So there's an example with a peach, but you can see the uh, slightly more technical definitions right here for the different three layers of the parent. Okay, so you, you ever get the question, is a tomato a fruit or is a tomato a vegetable? If you've heard that, the correct answer to both is yes. And it's because they're completely different vocabulary. Fruit is a scientific and botanical term, okay? So we just looked at the definition of a fruit. It's a ripened ovary. A tomato is a ripened ovary. Vegetable is a culinary term. 
And so if in the culinary world, people are calling tomatoes vegetables, that's fine. That has nothing to do with botany, okay? Um, and so if it has seeds in it, it's gonna be a fruit, okay? Uh, if it's come from an angiosperm. So cucumbers, fruits, you know, so that, that may help clarify that a little bit. Um, so many of these things we call vegetables are actually fruits. Okay, so all these fruits are developing from fertilized flowers. And so fruits connect to flowers. And in some cases you can see morphological similarities. Uh, here's a pear flower, here's a pear fruit. And you can see how the, the pistils contain the ovaries, the ovaries develop into the, the ovules develop into the seed, the ovaries develop into the fruit. You can see some structural similarities there. Um, when you have a, a blackberry or raspberry flower, uh, it's actually going to develop into a aggregate fruit, a compound fruit. And so you can kind of see some structural similarities there. And so sometimes that'll be helpful, sometimes not so helpful. We're basically now going to go over 10 different types of simple fruit and two types of compound fruit. So really what we're learning now is the 12 different uh, classifications of fruit uh, that will be fair game for midterm one and the later midterms. Um, so I've got them split up in this sort of hierarchy. So we're going to learn two compound fruits and these compound fruits modify one of the 10 types of simple fruit. So a compound fruit is basically just one of those 10 types of simple fruit, a bunch of them stuck together, okay? So you're gonna phrase them as a multiple of or an aggregate of the type of simple fruit that has a bunch of them stuck together, okay? The simple fruits are just that, there's only one of them. It's not a whole clump of them together. So that's the distinction there. Uh, we're gonna learn these simple fruits, eight of them, you can split them into whether they're dry or fleshy. Uh, actually, we're gonna learn 10, not eight. Let's put them into whether they're dry or fleshy. We're going to learn four fleshy fruits. And then if they're dry, you can split them into whether they're indehiscent or dehiscent. We'll learn three of each of those. An indehiscent fruit doesn't break apart on some natural line. A dehiscent fruit breaks apart along a natural line of suture. So that's the difference between indehiscent and dehiscent. Okay, so here are 10 types of fruits that we'll learn. So we have three dry indehiscent fruits, the akeens, samaras, and nuts. We have three dry dehiscent fruits, legumes, follicles, and capsules. And then we have our four fleshy fruits, which are going to be pomes, droops, berries, and the hesperidium. Uh, there are more types of fruit than this. We're kind of simplifying it a little, but this will cover most of our bases for the trees we're going to learn in lab this semester. And so uh, if we start out with the simplest fruit you can have, it is an akeen. Um, I don't have an example for you of a simple akeen in a species we have this semester. Uh, this is actually a multiple of akeens on this American sycamore. So each little dot here, that's going to be one akeen. And so that's a bunch of akeens stuck together, but I, I don't have an example to show you of a simple akeen. Um, a sunflower, if you eat a sunflower seed, that's going to be an akeen as well. So basically with an akeen, it's, you know, the fruit is not much more than the seed. It's a good way to think of it. A samara is a winged seed. So you've got a wing on there, and that's what defines a samara. There are two types of samaras that we'll see this semester. You can see the photo up there of red maple samaras. Uh, that's going to be one type, uh, and where it's like a wing sticking out the end of a seed. The other type, let me see if I can draw it up here for you. But what you'll have is what we call a coin or wafer like samara, where you have the seed right there, that blue circle I drew was the seed. And you'll have a wing here, the second circle is the wing, that completely encircles that seed. And so these may be real small, smaller than a dime as in the elms. They may be larger and more obvious as in hop tree, where it's more the size of a 50 cent piece. So a coin or wafer like Samara where the wing completely encircles the seed is our, is our other option. Get rid of that. Okay, so that's a Samara. Our third and final dry indehiscent fruit, you can see none of these split apart on any natural line, it's gonna be a nut. Uh, we're gonna learn burrow next week, it's our largest acorn. And so we know acorns are nuts, right? So our oaks, hickories, birches, beech, chestnuts, buttonbush, and basswoods 
all contain nuts. If a nut's real small, like they often are in the birches, we would call it a nut. Um, you can add lint to the end of a lot of these if they're real small. So if it's big, it's a droop. If it's small, it's a droop. Um, everyone pretty much knows what, the, what a nut is already, but there's the technical definition for you. Hard exterior, contains both the fruit and the seed. And then with nuts, often you have accessory tissues. That cap is an accessory tissue that originated from an involucra or whorl, if you want to think of it that way, of bracts. And so we can modify how we discuss nuts because they're kind of diverse. So there's other technical terms we can use because walnuts, hickory nuts, even acorns, they have these accessory tissues that go along with the nut. And so an acorn, we could call it blondes because the cap on there isn't technically part of the fruit, okay? Walnuts, we could call a pseudo droop uh, because they've got these uh, fleshy involucras surrounding the nut itself. Hickory, similar story, call that a trima. Um, and then sometimes you have wings to help fruits disperse by wind, but it's not a samara. So here's an example where you have the small fruit right here on a uh, hornbeam, Arbinus caroliniana, and you can see the leafy wing off to it. And so that's a nut enclosed in a wing like crack. So it has a wing, but it's still a nut and not a samara. So you can see it gets more complicated, can get a little confusing. Okay, so now we have our three dry theism fruits. All these split along natural lines. The first is a legume. And so we've all seen pea pods, bean pods, that's a legume. And they split on exactly two lines. The lines are usually right at the edges, okay? Um, and they're growing on a tree that's in the Fabaceae family. So legumes are specific to one family. All the others will be diverse across different taxa, but legumes are not. A follicle is a fruit that splits along one line, just one line. And so this is on Hercules Club. And so what you have is this little spherical white fruit, and it splits along one line that covers half a circumference. So once it opens up, you can see it on this one kind of looks like Pac-Man. And so if it only has one line of suture, that's a follicle. We only have a few examples, Hercules Club, the Magnolias, we don't see many of those. By far, our most common example of dry dehiscent fruits is capsules. So it can split along two or more lines, two or more lines. Here you see a crepe myrtle and you can see the multiple lines this capsule is splitting along. And when these capsules split and open, you can usually go and shake the tree and you'll just see a bunch of seed will rain down. So if you've ever gone under a crepe myrtle right after those capsules open, you shake the tree, you get a ton of seed. If you're under a sweet gum, right when the capsules open on what we call those gumballs, but it's actually just a bunch of capsules stuck together, you'll see a whole bunch of little seed rain down. So we have a few species that have capsules and all that's left now is our four fleshy fruits. And so as we look at these, uh, the first is a pome, and the best way to think of a pome is an apple. So we all know what an apple is. You've got a fleshy fruit with a woody or papery interior wall that a lot of people don't like to eat. Some people will eat that too. Um, hawthorns, pears, juneberry, they can be smaller than an apple. So on a hawthorn or a juneberry, they may be, you know, real small. So, you know, about half an inch in size or smaller even. So pomes don't have to be the size of an apple. Okay, pretty much everything that you want to call a berry, everything that we've grown up calling berries, are actually droops. Almost nothing that is actually a botanical berry do we call a berry. So that, that's a little bit messed up, but uh, if you have a fleshy fruit and you have to guess what it is because you don't know, guess droop. It's probably a droop. And so you can see cherries, mulberries, the sugar berry we're learning in lab this week, lots of other species are going to have droops. The best way to think about a droop is to think about a cherry or a peach, where it's a fleshy fruit with a stone pit in the middle. So that's, that's what you want to think about for droop. It doesn't have a bunch of seeds loosely dispersed in it. If it had a bunch of seeds loosely dispersed in it, that's what a true berry is. So when you look at true berries, grapes are true berries. We don't call them grape berries, but that's, you know, that would be botanically correct. Uh, pawpaw, persimmon, chinamwood. So we really don't have very many of these. Okay? Uh, blackberry has droops. Uh, anything you would put berry on probably has droops. 
And our last one's pretty straightforward. We all know what an orange is. The name, term for that fruit is a Hesperidium, but there it's basically just describing what an orange is. Uh, we'll learn trifoliate orange, an invasive species this semester. That's our one example of a Hesperidium. Okay, so those are the 10 types of simple fruit. Now let's look at compound fruits. The first option is an aggregate. And what distinguishes an aggregate is that all these simple fruits came from a single flower. So you had a flower with multiple ovules, which forms a compound, or sorry, an aggregate uh, fruit. So here's an example in Southern Magnolia. This little thing right here that has this one line of suture that this red seed emerges from, that's one follicle. But a whole bunch of follicles came from a single flower. So this fruit on a Southern Magnolia is gonna be an aggregate of follicles, okay? Our other option is multiple. And the distinction here now is it comes from more than one flower. You have a cluster of flowers and those, that cluster of flowers produces a compound fruit. So here's an example of our sycamore where it's a multiple of achenes. That cluster of flowers produced all these different little achenes that are stuck together. And here's our sweet gum ball, right? And so if you've got a sibling you grew up in the south, you've been hit with these. Uh, but you can see right here, there's two lines of suture that open on that little beak looking thing, and that drops the seed out. So that's one capsule. All of them are stuck together on this gumball. They came from a cluster of flowers. So that makes a sweet gumball a multiple of capsules. Okay, so that, that was a lot on fruits and flowers, but that only applies to angiosperms. For gymnosperms, we need different terminology because remember, gymnosperm means naked seed. They do not have ripened ovaries, therefore, gymnosperms do not have fruits. And so instead, we have cones, and we've got a little bit different terminology for the different parts of a cone. So when you look at a pine cone, for example, um, if you've ever pulled a pine cone apart, uh, what you'll notice is each of these scales you can remove. And within that scale, usually it will hold one or two seeds. So you see the seeds in the middle. Those seeds often have a bract on it, which works just like the wing in a Samara. It helps pine seed disperse via wind. The pines are wind dispersed. Uh, for the most part, we have some of our Western pines that'll be dispersed by wildlife. Uh, and then that sits on the wooden part of the cone, which is the scale, it's there to protect it. Um, there's some research out suggesting that gymnosperms evolved cones like this at about the time that dinosaurs roamed the earth. So the theory is that cones evolved to help protect seeds from dinosaurs. So uh, who knew? Uh, so here you see the pine seed with the wing on it. If you all have taken ecology with Dr. Kidd and you did the seed lab, hopefully you got to see some seed like this where they have all those machines to process it and help remove the wing uh, because you don't need the wing and it's you know, just helping it disperse. If you look at a cross section of a cone, a pine cone, you'll have the axis, you'll have the seeds in the middle, uh, which again are ripened ovules but no ripened ovary. And then the outside portion of the cone. So if you see a closed cone, the end of each scale looks like a little diamond. And often on it, there's this prickle. That exposed diamond shaped part of the scale is an apophysis rhymes with hypothesis, uh, and the prickly thing, the thing that's gonna hurt you or even maybe draw blood on some of these cones, that's the umbo. So some pine cones are armed, they have a real prickly umbo like all our southern pines. Some pine cones are unarmed, like eastern and western white pine. So uh, this, this diagram includes the four southern pines we'll learn in lab this semester, longleaf pine, slash pine, loblaw pine, and shortleaf pine. It also includes spruce pine, which is not native here in East Texas, but is native over in Louisiana. And so you can see they vary in size. On longleaf in particular, you can even see the etching, the marking, where the bract of the seed would sit in there. And you can see the little depression where the seed sits. Normally, I pass around a longleaf cone, which is probably not a good idea when you're growing up. Okay, our southern pines take two years to develop their cones. Okay. Here's an example of longleaf pine. Um, so pines aren't gonna have flowers. If you work at a nursery, everybody calls it a flower, that's fine. But from a botanical standpoint, they don't have flowers. Instead, they have a male or female stroboli. So male or female stroboli is one way to say it. Uh, stroboli being the word you would use instead of flower. And then you can also refer to them having either seed cones or pollen cones. 
This is bald cypress that we're learning this week in lab. Its cones take a single year to develop. So those bald cypresses over by the ag pond where we learn it, there's cones on that just about every year and they always look about the same each fall just because it's a new crop of cones each year. So seeds are great, fruits are great, but they're not always helpful in dendro. If you have a dioecious species and you've got a male tree, you're not gonna be able to use fruits to help identify it. Um, if you have a species like red maple, we're sitting here in the fall semester, red maple is gonna flower and fruit in the spring semester. So its fruits are of no help to you right now because it's just not the right time of year. Uh, trees may be too small or too young or too stressed to fruit at different times. And so if you get a seedling, don't expect to find fruits on it. Uh, some species can fruit pretty young or produce cones pretty young. I've seen cones on four-year-old lobole pines. So uh, some species, it may take 20 or 30 years before they'll get to reproductive maturity. Some fruits are great and really helpful to identify the tree like this persimmon, but wildlife love them, so they disappear pretty quickly. Uh, so they may be eaten really quick and you just, you don't see them. Uh, another example on this would be pawpaw. The fruits on pawpaw are consumed rapidly. They're never out for long. So. Okay, let, let's talk a little bit now about how fruits link up uh, with different aspects of the silvics of our tree species. And so I wanna give you uh, three specific examples here. Uh, this first is pin cherry. So pin cherry is a sweet tasting cherry. It's found in the Southern Appalachians up into the Northeastern United States. And it's a shade intolerant early successional species. So pin cherry only lives about 100 years and that seed and seedling and growing tree need a lot of light. So they only develop in big openings uh, where the mature forest canopy has just been removed, okay? So the ideal place for a pin cherry to germinate is in an area where a fire just burned through, uh, burned a lot of the overstory and opened up a lot of light. Then the pin cherry can take off, grow, dominate that site for about 100 years. Then it dies off and more shade tolerant vegetation comes in beneath it and takes over that stand. So sounds like it's got a, a great system, a great strategy, early successional. But the problem is, in many areas of the northeastern United States where pin cherry is common on the landscape, the fire return interval, or the average time between stand replacing fires, may be 800 years. So in the northeast, it's cool, they get a lot of rain, it just doesn't burn as much as we do here in the south. So how on earth does a tree that only lives for 100 years and needs fire to get started, survive in a landscape where on average each acre is going to only burn every 800 years or so. Well, part of it is there's a lot of variability. Every acre is an average, so that's part of the story. But the other part is in its seed biology. So how do you think this pin cherry seed is dispersed throughout the landscape? What disperses it? Yeah, wildlife, uh, birds in particular, which can fly and then drop you know, the pit uh, out from these troops. And so it has a mechanism to get its seed all over the place. So the seed gets widely dispersed by wildlife. Then the seed has another mechanism where it can stay. We talked about Beal's bottle experiment. It can stay viable in the seed bank on the forest floor for 30 years or more. So the seed gets out there, it stays out there. And so basically you've got seed all over the place. So if there is a fire in any given year, that replaces that stand, the pin cherry's there, it's ready to go, it's ready to get started. And so what you see is pin cherry only lasts for 100 years in each spot and then it's replaced by other species. But then you get a fire somewhere else on the vast landscape and that particular year, pin cherry pops up. And so pin cherry is always moving around where it is on the landscape uh, to these early successional habitats. But each time an early successional habitat opportunity becomes available, it's there, it's ready. So that's how its seed biology allows it to persist on the landscape. Yeah, Logan. Well, here I brought some seeds back from Oregon. Uh, um, if you put it in your yard and water it, it may be okay. Um, I've seen a coastal redwood growing in the mountains of Virginia in somebody's yard. Um, so if you take care of it, keep it in your yard, it may do okay. Uh, many species that are from further north that you plant here, uh, you know, a week like we had last week where the heat index is 110, they don't do well with that often, is what you find. So it may last for a while, you can try.
try it, but you know, the heat is what is most likely to get it around here. Okay, so let's talk about two more examples. Here's the next one, witch hazel. Can you tell from that photo what type of fruit this is? Exactly, it's a capsule. We can see that it's a dry fruit, and then it has two lines of suture that'll open up that capsule. So we're gonna learn witch hazel in lab. Witch hazel is native to East Texas. We find it on our music sites. Uh, you can guess from this photo with that white stuff in the background, that's not taken in East Texas. Um, so it grows all the way up the Appalachian Mountains into the Northeast. And so it grows in areas of the snow, harsh winters. It's kind of neat, very real cold winters. This type of unusual strategy is that it's wild and snow. Everything is snow, and it's Underneath the mother tree, so that it can hopefully land somewhere where there's enough light and it can germinate and form a new witch hazel shrub. Well, how it does that is a little different from some of the modes of dispersal we've talked about so far. What it does is this capsule builds up a whole lot of turtle pressure, builds up a lot of water pressure in there, and then eventually the wind will blow or an animal will knock against the tree or something will happen to disturb it. And it actually, with that pressure, shoots the seed like a little pop gun. And so it can actually fire its seed like 20 feet, and that'll hopefully help some of the seed clear out of way. That mother tree is playing this, but it's got a chance to succeed. But there's an interesting thing. Our final example I want to go over today is Table Mountain Pine, uh, Pinaceae Picea pungens. And Table Mountain Pine is a higher elevation, so 1,500 feet and higher in elevation, Southern Appalachian species. And it's gonna be very fire dependent. It's found on these very xeric south facing ridges in the Southern Appalachian Mountains. And so it has serotonous cones, serotonous meaning that they'll stay closed for the most part until heat, such as the heat from a fire, uh, actually opens them. 